This question starts by telling us that the table shows three design strategies. We are then instructed to complete the table by giving one advantage and one disadvantage of using each design strategy. The keywords here that I would underline upon reading this question are one advantage and one disadvantage. We can see that the total marks for the question are six. Therefore, we can realistically draw the conclusion that each blank box, which we've been asked to write either an advantage or disadvantage in for each design approach, is worth one mark. Therefore, we don't want to be leaving any of the boxes blank. The first thing that I would do before attempting to answer the question is to identify and clarify in my own mind what each design strategy actually is. Don't forget that there is often plenty of space around the outside edges of a question paper so that you can make to write notes on. I have found it useful here to draw a quick diagram that reminds me of the iterative design process, which is the first design approach that we are asked to look at. This will ensure that when I go to write my advantage and disadvantage of this strategy, I don't get in a muddle or confuse the iterative design approach with one of the other approaches in the table. Now, let's think about what iterative design actually is. So, as designers, we know that this is a cyclic process or repeated process that we will go through to ensure our final outcome is as good as it possibly can be. Designers may start at any point of the iterative cycle. For instance, they may start by testing existing products, evaluating them, and then designing and prototyping their own versions that they would then test and evaluate before redesigning and reprototyping and retesting and reevaluating and then redesigning and reprototyping, retesting and reevaluating and so on until this same cycle has continued a number of times and any issues are resolved and to ensure that the design can really be the very best that it could be. User-centred design, however, really focuses on the needs and wants of the end user and they are considered at every stage of the process. For instance, the users may be asked to give feedback several times on design ideas and be asked to test prototypes. They may be involved in focus groups, surveys or individual interviews. The third design approach that we've been given is systems thinking. Now this is where the design process is split into subsections of the input, process and output. This is generally used in mechanical or electrical systems. Metaphorically, I always like to remember systems thinking as similar to a vending machine or a toy grabber in an amusements arcade. For instance, if I was using a toy grabber machine, I would put my money in, which would be the input. I would operate the arm of the toy grabber, which would be akin to the process, and receive my winning toy as the output. Now that we have ensured we have recalled the three different approaches and that we are certain we know what each one is, we should consider the advantages and disadvantages of each. Now, when you complete this question, I would recommend completing both the advantage and disadvantage of each design strategy at the same time. Rather than doing all of the advantages first and then all of the disadvantages, as I find that this may confuse me between the different design strategies. So, to help me identify the advantages and disadvantages of iterative design first, 
I will refer back to the diagram that I have written next to this design strategy. So, we know that iterative design is the cyclic process of designing, prototyping, testing, evaluating, designing, prototyping, testing, evaluating. So, we can identify that drawing the constant testing and evaluation, it's likely that any issues are realised and resolved earlier in the process than they would be if this process wasn't repeated. So, for instance, if I had just designed a product, made a prototype, tested it, and then evaluated just as it was about to hit the shelves of a shop, I may not have identified certain issues until I had customers complaining or until it was too late and the product was already been sold. Likewise, we must consider that creating and testing prototypes can be time consuming and expensive, especially when many iterations are required. So even though we often prototype using alternative materials, which can be cheaper or scaled down, this can soon become expensive when prototyped a number of times. Moving on to the next design approach. Again, I will remind myself of my notes. The needs and wants of the end user are considered at each stage. So this means that for user-centered design, an advantage is that the end user has a sense of greater ownership through their contributions to the realized outcome. So this means somebody cares what I think and somebody has listened to me. And therefore, when the final product is created or the final outcome, I will feel a greater sense of connection to that outcome. This could either be individually or by knowing that others in the same target market that I am within have been listened to and that their views mattered enough to be considered. Now considering this as the advantage, we can start to begin to process a disadvantage of this strategy. So if my point of view is been listened to throughout the design process, it could become a disadvantage if the design becomes too biased or focused upon the requirements of one particular end user. So for instance, there are many 15 year olds in the world, yet if I design a product based upon the preference of just one of these 15 year olds, it could mean that my product excludes the views of other 15 year olds and that then my product becomes very biased or very focused upon that one particular end user who may not actually be representative of the whole target market. Finally, we move on to the last advantage and the last disadvantage, this time of systems thinking. So we know that system thinkings are broken down into the subsystems of input, process and output. So we can consider that by breaking the system down into subsystems, it will be easier to find errors or faults. They can be identified more quickly. For instance, metaphorically speaking again, if we go back to my toy grabber machine and I put money into that machine, yet it chucks the money out or it fails to start, we know that there is probably an issue with the input. If it took my money fine, however, when I go to operate the mechanical arm, it does not move or it goes in the wrong direction, we can establish that the problem is probably lying with the process. Therefore, we would investigate into just this part of the system to try and rectify the issue that we are encountering. Likewise, however, by breaking the system down into subsystems, it can lead to the use of components which are not entirely always necessary 
And again, this could lead to extra costs and bulkier systems. There we go. We have our six answers here, which are all worthy of a mark. There may have been other answers that you could have given too, which might be just as credit worthy. However, it's worth considering that although we have only been asked to give one advantage and one disadvantage of using each design strategy, if you can also try to explain your answer a little, like we've done in this example, it means that the examiner can really seek to understand what you are trying to say and why. And this can make the difference between being awarded the credit where it is due and not. If there is one other key takeaway from this question, it is the importance of making initial notes to organise my existing knowledge of the design strategy and to prompt advantages and disadvantages that I wrote. Often, the advantages and disadvantages feed from each other. And this will help us to systematically answer the question to avoid writing the wrong answers in the wrong columns.